Welcome back to Beijing House and welcome to the Three Rivers Museum of Local History. I'm Fabian Hiscock and I'm the Chairman of the Three Rivers Museum Trust. This morning we have our Collections Manager Pat Hamilton who is going to take us through the home front display the Second World War in Rickmansworth in the area between 1939 and 1945. My name is Pat Hamilton and I'm the Collections Manager for Three Rivers Museum. Now, 2020 was the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War and we decided that this would be a good opportunity to look at various aspects of the home front in our local area at this time. So, we have contacted um, various local people who very generously lent us artefacts, photographs, as well as sharing their memories of being alive at the beginning of the First Second World War. Now let's first of all look at this, which was lent to us from Margaret in Abbots Langley. Uh, one of the fears at the beginning of the Second World War was that gas was going to be used. So very early in 1939, gas masks were issued. And this particular one would be for a small baby. You see there's a, a doll in there to demonstrate how it would be used. A friend of ours who gave us some of her memories was saying about how her niece, when she was first put in one of these, screamed so much that her mother decided never to put her in it again. So this is the one that was used for babies. And now we're now going to move over and have a look at the ones that were used for small children. And here we are. This is the so-called Mickey Mouse gas mask. It looks rather a terrifying thing for a small child to use, but the advice given to parents was that if it was used as a game, it could become quite an amusing, fun thing for children to wear. What we hear from various people is that somehow or other, they used to blow very loudly into it and make rude noises, and so they certainly did amuse themselves. Now, we also have a lot of articles which have been donated to us or lent to us to do with uh, uh, the Home Guard and the ARP air raid precautions. Here we are, a torch and a whistle, which would have been used by the air raid wardens, as well as this bicycle lamp which would have been used in the blackout. It must have been extremely difficult to find your way through. I would imagine you having lights just such as this, lighting your way. We have some memories that people have given us to do with what happened when there were air raids, which I'll just read a little bit to you. This is from Shirley. My parents would walk to Bob and Maud's house in Watford Road. This is from Franklin Road, in, in Watford Road, complete with my night clothes. My father and Bob would then go to on home guard duty and the mothers and children, Joan and Tony Barton and I, would spend the night in their comparatively comfortable Anderson-style heated shelter. Joan and I would top and tail in the top bunk and Tony would sleep in the lower bunk. I think the mothers spent most of their time talking or knitting and when the men came back off duty, our family would then return home ready for a normal day. And there's a little story that she told a father in the Home Guard. It involves the duty patrol at the bridge at the bottom of Scotts Hill. One very cold New Year's Eve, Mrs Grant of Grant's Whiskey, who lived at Scottsbridge House, came out to the men on duty and said, You must be very cold. I'll get something to warm you. The men were overjoyed expecting some whiskey. But when Mrs. Grant returned, she brought them mugs of soup for each of them. A little bit of a disappointment there by the sound of it. One of the aspects which would have affected everybody in the country was that of rationing of food. Many other things were rationed as well, but food would have affected everybody. And we have here a list of the wartime rations which an adult would have received each week. Children received half of it. Bacon and ham, four ounces, butter, two ounces, cheese, two ounces, margarine, four ounces, milk, three pints, dried milk as well, sugar, eight ounces, preserves, a pound every two months, tea, two ounces, one egg, 
packet of dried egg a month and sweets 12 ounces that does seem rather a lot of sweets actually it seems to me um obviously it would have been very difficult to put meals together with things like this and there are recipes that we found which will probably not appeal too much nowadays here's a recipe which we have for roast hearts take two sheep's hearts to start off with and another what i don't think i'd quite like this savory tripe casserole with tripe sheep's kidney calves liver and so on probably not would appeal to present day tastes and let's have a quick look at what would have been on the menu at the, the the dinner for the home guard in 1944 here we are um, this is a copy of the menu and we have all the signatures there of the men who attended it soup roast boiled and roast potato and baked potatoes baked marrow and apple sauce followed by trifle and cream apple tart and cream and cheese slices it shows the restrictions that would have been in those days we have a re we have a menu for a few years later in the early early 50s i think it is which shows a, a much more lavish meal um what would children be doing in those days we have a little sample here of some of the toys which they might have had in the 1950s. Monopoly, of course, was around. Meccano and train sets, Hornby train sets. Um, I know the little boy who played with this train set very well, because he is, in fact, my father. So there was plenty to keep children entertained. Lots of things, of course, we still have today, snakes and ladders and so on. Let's think about what sort of things people might be doing for entertainment. We have a rather nice photograph here of dancing at the Ebury Hall, so people were out and about, still having a good time. Here's an example of some of the clothes they might be wearing at the time, utility clothing. We have actually a couple of labels, which I think are probably quite unusual, which are from clothes which were issued at the time. And these are the utility labels. Now, youngsters at the time would still have been able to go to scouts and guides, and quite a few of the people who have sent us their memories were involved in scouts and guides. So let's find out a couple of things that they might have been doing at the time. John has sent us some of his memories of being in scouts in um, Proxy Green, in the scout hut along Watford Road. And he says, we could buy National Milk Cocoa, which was like drinking chocolate, bread, marge and jam, and it was sold by the duty patrol after meetings for one penny. They still carried on camping, when the war didn't seem quite so dangerous, after camouflaging their tents. There was camping at Faisal's Wood, Chorley Wood and Well End, but there would of course be no fires at night. Um, the campfires were in the uh, troop room. I don't know if you'd be allowed that nowadays. Uh, another thing he mentions um, was standing outside the scout hut on the Watford Road in Proxy Green, witnessing hundreds of tanks and army lorries going through. And this was in preparation for D-Day. This was also mentioned by Shirley, who says that she and her mother were trying to get to the shops in New Road from Franklin Road and had to wait for seemingly hours before they decided to turn back and go another time. So that's quite a vivid memory, obviously, for some of the people at the time. So that was uh, the Scouts, which obviously carried on. Um, one of the other aspects early on in the war would have been the effect of evacuees coming to um, the area. We have a photograph here of Berry Lane in Mill End, 1939, a bus bringing first evacuees from London. And we have we have, in addition, various memories from a lady called Joan Schneider, who lived in the area. She no longer lives around here. And her mother was involved in housing the, uh, the evacuees. We have some memories in the museum as well of actual people who were evacuated there. There's a little bit here from Edna, who sent us lots of information. And at the outbreak of the war, she was at guide camp at Milford-on-Sea with the uh, very well-known Captain 
Miss May Barton Smith being in charge there. And when they came back, it says, we were anxious to get home. This is um, September the 1st, 1939. We were anxious to get home to our families. When we arrived at the guild house later than expected, our parents were waiting, in my case, accompanied by an evacuee. She'd been away for two weeks, came back home, someone else was going to be in the house. They'd arrived at St Albans Church School, Hoban, and had been billeted on local families. Our girl was nine years old, and her mother and two brothers billeted next door. When, I, when we arrived home, she proceeded to show me round my own house, including our bedroom, as we were to share my double bed. How things change. The influx of so many children in the village, this is Crocsley Green we're talking about, meant that schools were inadequate, so they were used in the morning by evacuees and in the afternoon by local children, and then reversed. Pat, um, thank you. Is there still research going on locally? Can, can people get involved in any of this now? If anybody was alive at the beginning of the, uh, in the uh, Second World War or knows of anyone who was, we would be most delighted to hear from them. Um, they could contact us through the museum. Um, if you look at the museum website, there'll be contact details there. Um, for the next few weeks in November, we will be closed, but hopefully it will open up again in December on Saturdays. So if anyone knows of anyone who's got any information or memories they'd like to share, or indeed photographs, we would be absolutely delighted to hear from them. Pat, thank you very much indeed for showing us around the collection.